thanks to the QED team for organizing this event in the EBF office. It's a pleasure for me to speak about European banks in our EBF office, which is the House of European Banks. We are approaching the 10th anniversary of the upsurge of the financial crisis. As you know, it all started with severe liquidity problems in some banks, followed by insolvency and widespread systemic risk. It's almost 10 years. The capital requirements regulation was meant to be a firm response to the crisis. And now, with the benefit of hindsight, we can assess the result. The European banking sector has increased its resilience significantly. The capital ratios of European banks have moved from a barely 6% in the crisis to a 13.6% now. That improvement in terms of capital that uh, was mainly thanks to uh, raising fresh capital in the market and retained earnings has also given a boost to the leverage ratio from less th than 3% to more than 5%. And also in terms of uh, liquidity, we have improved from a barely 75% short-term liquidity ratio to a level that is way above the minimum requirement today. So in short, the lesson has been learned, but far from complacency, we need to update the regulation. That's something that we discussed uh, some five years ago with, uh, with MEP, uh, the rapporteur, MEP uh, Otmar Karas, and we said that was one of the points we made. It is such a complex and arguably the most prolific regulation ever negotiated in the European Parliament that we'll need to stop at some point and reconsider what we've done and looking forward, review the uh, complexity and all the terms of the capital requirements regulation. We are now at that moment and in the EBF uh, we want to make some recommendations as to how to make this review of the regulation more successful at a time when it's clear that there are more objectives, not only financial stability, what is a very important one, but also finance and growth and other objectives are over the table. So I would like to make some recommendations uh, from the point of view of banks. The first one uh, was the fast track and successfully uh, was achieved by the Maltese presidency last Friday. So uh, we can congratulate the Maltese uh, presidency for having delivered on their commitment during this semester. And looking forward, we would like to see other objectives met in the, uh, in the negotiation of the trialogue. The first one is to secure the competitiveness of the European banks and the level playing field. For that purpose, there are some key issues. Uh, the first one, to put on hold the fundamental review of the trading book for obvious reasons. First, because it needs to be finalized by Basel and also because we have news from the other side of the Atlantic, so we... We wouldn't like to see that Europe is, again, front-loading international standards. We support them, but we should go at the same time as others and when there is clarity from the Basel Committee. Another point is to set a clear-cut definition of Pillar 2, where systemic risk should not be included, not to mix up microprudential supervision with macroprudential supervision. That has been the source of a lot of confusion. Today, the policy toolbox for macroprudential oversight is so wide that regulators, supervisors can pick out any measure and put it in place. We don't need to mix it up with Pillar 2. And third point about competitiveness, uh, we need to preserve the capacity of European banks to hire digital talent in the same conditions as, as companies of other sectors do. So in remuneration policies... Uh, the, we should have um, an exclusion of from the remission policies to uh, technological, uh, technology professionals who are not known to be um, material risk takers, obviously. A second, ob second objective is to support market uh, liquidity. And here we have uh, a number of recommendations, but there are two outstanding ones that have to do with the NSFR. In the first place, the asymmetric treatment of uh, repos that doesn't uh, grant any available source of funding factor to repos. However, reverse repos are requested 5 to 10 percent um, uh, factor. So we need to do something about that uh, because of the, the, the sheer volume of repos in Europe that is more than 5 trillion means that it is a bit hazardous to have this asymmetry. It's very difficult to anticipate what will happen, but the, the massive amount of repos... Uh, 
um, I think uh, calls for a careful reflection uh, before taking decisions on these on these rules. Then the NSFR derivative rules should also be carefully uh, reviewed to avoid any detrimental effect on corporates that use derivatives mainly for hedging uh, financial risk. A third objective uh, would be to translate the single rule book and the banking union into prudential uh, realities. Uh, much effort has been put. Uh, it's been a daunting task to complete the, the single rule book the single market, and in the euro area, the single supervisor and the single resolution mechanism. So this needs to have an effect in the prudential regulation, some kind of effect. We know it is not completed yet, but there should be some recognition. One, an opportunity we have is to uh, make the NSFR waiver, uh, NSFR waiver for liquidity subgroups automatic instead of upon discretion of the supervisor so that uh, it should be uh, treated across member states as it is within the same member state. And also the preferential treatment of cross-border intra-group transactions is of the essence in the European Union. If we want to see also that there is uh, really uh, a field where we can see cross-border transactions. This uh, in brackets and out of the, the speech we have a clear case with what happened in Spain last week. Um, it was success, successful in the sense that we didn't see any, uh, any creditor queuing in the street. We didn't see any taxpayer money. We didn't see any recourse to deficit, public deficit. That was good. It's, uh, there, there is also a flip side. But what we would like to see in the future is that this can happen with cross-border transactions because the benefits of the banking union would be limited if we put constraints to the movement of liquidity and capital. It was in this case two banks of the same country, one rescuing the other, but this could also happen between across borders and between different countries. We need to think about the consequences of these um, NSFR terms, also with an effect on BRD. And um, also an important objective that the Commission has uh, put forward in the original uh, proposals uh, was to limit the burdens on regulation and supervision However, we think that more needs to be done in terms of scope and granularity. There are many examples, but some of them are uh, blatantly, blatantly clear to us, like, for instance, this, uh, the fact that uh, we are requesting hypothetical disclosures for IRB banks on the standardized approach. That is uh, not only uh, um, unnecessary, but it also could be misleading if we are publishing information that is not effective for the banks. Also, the granularity of details in the counterparty credit risk and operational risk uh, could be limited. And in the case of the liquidity ratio, it should be enough to, to disclose uh, the total amounts of in inflows and outflows at the end of the month without the need to go further into details because, after all, the supervisor monitors it on a daily basis. So there is, uh, as I said uh, before, one of the most interesting elements of these packets is the, the growth and innovation dimension. And here I would like to refer to an asset class that is sometimes forgotten, what is trade finance, that is hit by different rules, leverage, liquidity, and capital, and we need to look at trade finance as a business model. There is uh, much to do in terms of uh, reviewing downwards the factors in the NSFR. We also have the exposures covered by export credit agencies in the leverage ratio that need to be revisited. Uh, the Council is known to have taken on board this point. Uh, however, that's only for countries uh, with a rating of uh, greater than AA-. Minus. Uh, this needs to be revisited because uh, it would be discriminatory, not for banks, but for the corporates behind that are making use of export credit. We can put some examples there, but, uh, I mean, a, a company in, in a country should have the same conditions and the same access to credit that a company in other countries when we talk about export credit. And also important is to preserve the competitiveness of European uh, companies, the cost of hedging is one of our concerns as well. As I mentioned before, the NSFR rules for derivatives should be carefully reviewed 
and the standardized approach for counterparty credit risk seems to be uh, overestimating the capital requirements of derivative exposures. And now let me refer to a major issue in the com competitive profile of European banks, uh, what is the capacity to innovate and contribute to the digitalization of the European economy. And uh, banks need to invest a huge amount in software. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are plans to invest uh, um, more than uh, 10 billion euros per year in the next years in uh, software development. Uh, that is used for cybersecurity and to compete in the, in the new technological era. And uh, however, software investment is uh, penalized in Europe because it requires full deduction from capital, what is 12 times more expensive than in other jurisdictions. Something needs to be done about this. And given that it's not in the original uh, proposal, we claim that it should be put in the Parliament report and be discussed properly during the trial. We support also the SME supporting factor. It, it proved to be effective uh, from 2014, so we think it is warranted to extend it for uh, beyond the, the 1.5 uh, million exposure with a discount factor of 15%, and equally we should do something about infrastructure finance that uh, is supported mainly by banks in Europe to uh, projects in transportation, renewable energies, hospitals, and so on. In conclusion, I think the name of the organizer uh, is perfectly fit uh, for purpose at this moment. Quod erat demonstrandum. The banking system is much more robust in Europe than it was seven years ago. And looking forward, we have to strike the right balance and be very careful about the decisions uh, taken in the Parliament to secure a strong, more competitive, and stable banking system in Europe going forward. Thanks for your attention.